uh, in theory. Okay, so uh, to start from the very beginning, okay, everybody is everybody is familiar with uh, pneumatic liquids, and that's because we all watch television, and we know that uh, LCD displays are driven by this phenomenon, and uh, it's quite interesting, and it's basically a, a symmetry breaking phase that uh, is, is typically associated with actual liquids, uh, molecules and liquids. But in our case, uh, it's uh, actually the electronic pneumatic phases that are extremely interesting that have been uh, discovered fairly recently. And you know the majority of work has really been in these two families of ITC superconductors, which is what has really driven uh, enormous interest in studying and understanding electronic pneumatic phases, in particular their connection to superconductivity. Um, so it's well known now, but you know, as of 10, 15 years ago, this was not known at all, uh, that, that the high C cuprates have uh, charge order all over the place. In fact, you know, this is probably already outdated, this phase diagram. Um, and uh, pneumatic phases that, uh, well, that's a bit more mysterious, but uh, there's definitely evidence of some kind of pneumatic symmetry breaking in the cuprates. Um, and then in more recent times, the nictides have been studied quite a bit and also have shown uh, uh, electronic pneumatic fluctuations in order. And I'll talk a bit about uh, the nictides in, in the, the groundbreaking work that was done to understand that phase diagram. But you see that these charge and pneumatic orders and fluctuations tend to be uh, strongly tied to the superconducting state. And that's what, uh, you know, for superconduct superconductivity aficionados, that's what makes it so interesting because we want to believe perhaps that pneumatic fluctuations or order or something like that is actually driving some enhancement in pairing. You know, of course, we want to know why is TC 100 Kelvin. Um, Okay, so I'm not going to delve into that subject in detail, but I'll touch on it a little bit as we go because we have some evidence that pneumatic fluctuations are actually enhancing superconductivity in our system. Okay, so um, the, the really groundbreaking experiment, um, in my mind, in electronic pneumatic susceptibility was the uh, work by Ian Fisher, in particular Jun Hao Chu, who was a uh, uh, postdoc at the time, who developed this really simple yet powerful experiment that uh, is, you know, being used by numerous groups around the world today to study this phenomenon. And you know, it's it's really amazing, and it's simple to the to the extent that my graduate student was interested in setting up this experiment because we routinely do transport measurements, but we don't do this. Ex we didn't do this experiment. And he said, "Can I try it?" I said, "Sure, go ahead." You know, it's a fairly low cost experiment. And he set it up and he did it. And it's really just straining. Um, well, you know, it's not simple in the sense of <laughs> set up and the, the thinning of samples and so on. I, I might be simplifying a bit too much, but the the uh, the extent of the actual experiment and measurement is quite simple. You're just simply thinning down. You're you're straining thin samples of of something and, and measuring the transport response. And so this very simple experiment uh, led to quite an explosion of interest in the fact that studying this susceptibility of this, uh, this um, anisotropy in the transport, essentially the XX minus YY resistivity as a function of strain, much like the uh, magnetic susceptibility, uh, looking at the linearity of this as a function of some temp uh, parameters such as temperature, uh, amazingly showed quite nice Curie-Weiss behavior in this iron nictide material. And this was diverging as, a, as you approach the uh, orthorhombic transition in this system. And that really opened up the floodgates to understanding and, and studying this phenomenon in connection with superconductivity, as well as the magnetism and structural order. Um, and it's since been studied in many iron compounds. You, you know, you can, this is also, um, um, this is uh, uh, several years ago, uh, but the barium compounds, various dopings near superconductivity as a function of doping. The iron selenium system has been studied quite a lot more recently because it shows uh, 
uh, quite significant pneumatic fluctuations as well as pneumatic order, et cetera. Um, more recently, at least, uh, and to some surprise, pneumatic susceptibility and sort of pneumatic fluctuations as measured by its susceptibility has also been seen in the heavily whole doped iron nictides such as potassium, rubidium, and cesium iron arsenide. This was quite surprising because these are uh, relatively low TC materials. Uh, and you know, of course they have some connection to the iron superconductors, but it's somewhat withdrawn from the overall phase diagram and they have their own interesting physics. Um, but you can see quite readily that there's some nice pneumatic susceptibility in these compounds. And there's been some suggestion that the, the magnitude of these things scales somehow with some uh, correlation effects that give rise to a large uh, residual heat capacity, for instance. But that's another subject. Um, also studied by Shubayuchi and company, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, there was some evidence that in fact, in, in the cesium iron arsenide, uh, sorry, in the rubidium iron arsenide, as you study that as a function of barium substitution, there's actually a switching of the dominant susceptibility channel from, from B2G to B1G. And that was suggestive of some crossover from Ising-like pneumatic uh, fluctuations to XY. And that's quite interesting in itself. And that's, I think, a newer frontier of study to study the the, uh, the symmetry channels that are, sh are showing uh, some kind of susceptibility. Okay, so, um, you know, just to back up a few steps, um, you know, when we study these kinds of orders and systems, uh, the sort of textbook situation we're used to is, is um, studying these different degrees of freedom, particular structure is, is, is uh, the crystal structure, the magnetic channel, the spin order, and it's in isotropy and of course orbital or some kind of electronic or charge degrees of freedom. And uh, when a rotational symmetries break in, these, these properties must break the same corresponding symmetry, these three ones. Um, now, the, uh, you know, usually it's a structural transition that drives the symmetry breaking as shown here by the bad guy. And the other guys follow along. But you know, not uncommon now, it's actually the orbital degrees of freedom that matter and they actually drive uh, uh, symmetry breaking in the other channels. And that's a non-trivial thing. And you can see Raphael's nice uh, review article here in 2014 for more details. Um, what was of interest to us also was the fact that there's, there were suggestions you know, leading from the uh, coup rate and nictide observations that uh, pneumatic fluctuations, in particular as a, upon approach to some pneumatic critical point or, or entrance to a pneumatic order, would actually enhance fluctuate, uh, uh, I'm sorry, would actually enhance superconducting pairing. Um, and that's interesting because it could even happen in the sort of S wave channel uh, or the so Q equals zero channel because of the nature of pneumatic uh, fluctuations. And so that's of course of interest, but you first need to have some kind of system where you can cleanly study the pneumatic fluctuations as a function of some parameter. And you know the trouble is that, uh, not trouble, but the uh, complication is that in the known systems, cuprates and nictides in particular, um, there's magnetic order around. And, uh, or the temperature scales are extremely large and it's hard to really get down to the low energy phenomena. And so it's, uh, it was to our delight that we found some system that actually was void of magnetic order fluctuations. And we happened to discover this phenomenon here. And that's the barium nickel arsenide system. So this, uh, uh, this system itself has been known for many, many years. Um, it's an interesting system in that uh, back in the days when the iron nictides were first discovered in 2008 or so, um, you know the the uh, uh, the isostructural materials were were of course looked at immediately to try to find whether non-iron based uh, compounds with similar structure would also show superconductivity. And so, for instance, Phil Ronning and uh, company at Los Alamos quickly looked at the nickel arsenide 
And it has a strikingly similar transport behavior to the iron-based compounds in that there's some kind of transition around almost the same temperature as in barium iron arsenide. But in fact, the nature of this transition is quite different. It's uh, not going from tetragonal to orthorhombic, but tetragonal to a triclinic phase transition, which is the lowest symmetry crystal structure you can get. And, um, and this was a strongly first order transition. That together with the fact that there was no known magnetic order here made this system actually somewhat different from the iron compounds. The other uh, observation, of course, was that there, you can see down here, there's superconductivity at quite low temperature. I'll, I'll get back to that. So the tetragonal to triclinic transition is, is like this. There's a distortion. And triclinic has, of course, low symmetry. And you can see that there's no right angles anywhere. And the, the system distorts uh, in all directions. Um, the superconductivity was nevertheless studied very uh, uh, intensely to see if there was anything interesting. And it was concluded quite quickly that it's, it seemed to be a fairly plain BCS phonon mediated superconductor. And that's based on heat capacity studies um, and thermal conductivity studies, which showed a full gap structure, et cetera. And you see the TC is about 0.65 Kelvin. So it's low TC, you know, not that, not that much interest in it. And it kind of was dropped. Um, we're all, so I'm going to talk about the barium to strontium series. And the strontium system also is fairly boring in some sense. And I'd say it's, of course, even more boring. And you'll see at the end of the talk why that's the case. But amazingly, it's very close to some very interesting physics. Uh, but strontium itself is actually quite boring. The transport shows nothing. It just looks metallic, um, fairly, fairly liquid-like. Uh, it does show superconductivity also. This is all tetragonal though, it's a tetragonal phase. The superconductivity, much like the uh, barium case, looks to be uh, BCS-like and likely phonon mediated. And that's also given by thermal transport and heat capacity studies, fully gap behavior, et cetera. Okay, so uh, you know our study uh, actually orig originated probably 10 years ago with the question of what happens in between these phases. This is a sort of academic question. How do you get from one to the other? And does anything interesting happen? I was also quite interested to understand how you got from the barium to the strontium phase. Uh, and in between somewhere, whether there was a dimerization of the arsenide, or the, I should say the arsenic atoms in between, causing a so-called structural uh, tetragonal collapse of the system, which is a well-known phenomenon in, the, for instance, the calcium iron arsenide system, which we studied quite a bit. Um, so uh, I won't address that today, but the answer, short answer is yes, there is a collapse, but it's a very subtle effect, but it does seem to play a role in the phase diagram. Um, now to give you the answer, and this was mainly the work of Chris Eckberg, as I said, um, he studied actually both uh, some doping effect of the nickel arsenide, but also the barium to strontium phase diagram. They both are interesting. Um, what I'm gonna focus on today is the strontium series. And the answer is essentially here that you can suppress continuously this triclinic uh, distortion uh, to some point around 70%, and you can enhance superconductivity by quite a bit. Um, this is, I should, sorry, I made a mistake here, but this is times 10, so it's not 40 Kelvin, unfortunately, but it's closer to four Kelvin, you see. But nevertheless, that's a huge increase from the, the parent, so-called parent compound. So this is an early phase diagram we had, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this quite extensively to, to talk about that. Okay, so um, as I said, we, uh, we had some evidence early on that there was some interesting splitting in the um, structural peaks in neutron scattering, study with Jeff Lynn, and we went on to study uh, this further with X-ray scattering with Peter Avalante's group in Illinois. And it, Fairly quickly, they discovered that uh, there is indeed a charge order. And not only that, but it's quite interesting in that there's multiple charge orders. So this is data from 2019, basically showing that, um, OK, here's the structural peak you can follow as you cool down. And it hits, this is the tetragonal peak. And at 135 Kelvin, it has a strong first order transition to a triclinic phase, as shown here. 
But to, to our surprise, there was also some charge order peaks observed that were um, both incommensurate and commensurate. And not only that, but there was a charge order peak that appeared in the tetragonal phase. So I'll elaborate on that, but that was quite interesting. And then once you go over to this uh, triclinic phase, there's a commensurate charge order that comes in and, and quick, basically, it just starts to appear right at the transition and quickly locks into some, uh, some Q vector that's commensurate. It's, it's 0.33, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more. I should say also, please ask me questions if you uh, have them, assuming that's the okay format to go along with. Um, otherwise, I'm just talking to my screen the whole time. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Is there a question? No? Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm just uh, 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 separating these two phases here to talk about them a bit separately. So as I said, there's, a, there's evidence of an incommensurate charge order peak in the tetragonal phase. And then once you cross over to the triclinic phase, there's a commensurate charge order. The Q vectors are 0.28 in the tetragonal uh, rayon zone and 0.33 in the triclinic rayon zone. Um, and these are, as shown, these are unidirectional, but I'll elaborate on this one. So at first we believed uh, this was a unidirectional, unidirectional charge order uh, as well as this one, but the triclinic one is not necessarily super interesting because it's a triclinic phase and it's broken all symmetries. But uh, this unidirectional charge order in the tetragonal phase breaks the C4 symmetry or apparently does. So that of course was quite interesting. Uh, I will, we, we later found that not to be true exactly and I'll explain that. But uh, just to, uh, just to touch on one thing that I know Peter always likes to highlight is although you know this distortion to triclinic is quite uh, subtle in some sense, meaning you know if you think about the actual distortions, they're quite small, even though they break all the symmetries. Uh, you one might think that this 0 0.28 to 0 0.33 is a very small change as well, but in fact, I'll just note that this direction in the triclinic brand zone is quite different. You can see the triclinic. Uh, brayon zone or, or unit cell is drawn here over top of the tetragonal one. And there's a huge, you know, uh, rotation. So this 0.33 peak is quite different than the 0.28. It's not, it's not at all the same. Uh, so you can see that here. Um, that's the first point. Uh, the second point in passing is that there was some work uh, in 2021, which I'm not sure is published yet, by Michael Mares in uh, the Mine Gas Group which claim that actually uh, there is an orthorhombic distortion just before you hit the triclinic phase. So here's the, the tetragonal phase, and this is a dilatation experiment uh, claiming to say that there is actually some splitting of the 100 and 111 uh, measurements showing some evidence of a orthorhombic phase. And it's more clear as you add, whoops, this is 3% phosphorus. As you add phosphorus, uh, it's it's definitely more clear. So, so I, I'm not, yeah. Is that seen in, in this version? Or? Uh, this paper does show some, and I'm not exactly sure how strong the evidence is in that I'm talking about the pure compound because mm -hmm. it is a quite subtle effect, but they, uh, uh, Michael does, you know, is, is insistent that that is an orthorhombic phase. I think this, uh, Perhaps it's better to ask Peter you know, his opinion on this, but I'm not so sure uh, it's solid. But certainly as you add phosphorus, this is clear. So that's quite interesting and it, it opens some questions about this phase. Okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, and then, so regarding the, uh, the triclinic phase, of course, there's been some nice work from Ming Yi, who I assume is in the audience. Uh, and, uh, I was finally able to review this paper a little bit. It's quite nice work uh, showing that uh, a few interesting things. First of all, it confirms this unidirectional charge order phase, but spectroscopically using photo emission. Um, very nice uh, uh, 
uh, evidence of the uh, distortion in the band structure as well as the folding of the rayon zone with the, the charge order. Um, and also showing that the uh, order parameter for the charge order actually looks different uh, than the structural order. So that's quite interesting. And I haven't digested this yet to try to understand the implications. Um, but it's, it's quite nice work. So that's, uh, that's fairly recent. And I should just say right now that there's been, uh, I don't know, about five or six papers that have appeared on archive in the last two, two three months. So it's, uh, uh, so there's some very active work on this right now. Okay. Now regarding this uh, uh, tetragonal phase charge order, um, what uh, Peter's group found out in a, a more extensive study was that looking beyond the first Brion zone, they actually found that it was not unidirectional. And a long story short, essentially it looks like a so-called 4Q state where you see that uh, you know, this is drawn in multiple Brion zones where the splitting of the peaks, which previously, previously was observed, let's say just in one, the first Brion zone here, if you go to the next one, you actually see the alternate splitting in the opposite direct in that orthogonal direction. And so that's evidence that it actually is not unidirectional. So it's 0.28 uh, um, in the first brain zone, let's say, and the second one would be 0 0.280. 0. Okay, so that changes a little bit the picture or the understanding of the uh, uh, connection between the charge order and the pneumatic phase, which I'll get to as we go on. Uh, that, that we still have to understand. Okay, so um, now once we uh, established that there was charge order, we then went on to study the, uh, uh, look for evidence of pneumatic susceptibility via elastoresistance experiments. And so, uh, you know, there's just some details of this experiment. It's uh, fairly simple, although you really need to do this carefully to, do, to measure things properly. You need a very thin sample of single crystal. It has to be oriented in a specific way to be able to probe a certain symmetry. And this is tetragonal crystal, of course, at higher temperature, but this is tetragonal, so it makes this experiment a bit more uh, amenable to analysis and interpretation. If you have a lower symmetry, it gets more complicated and you can't necessarily do this kind of experiment to directly probe the elastic resistance. But in a tetragonal system, as was shown in the iron compounds, you can do this readily. So this is glued to a piezo stack. And for instance, on the back, you can glue a strain gauge and measure the str strains in situ as you apply voltage to the piezo stack. And then in, in situ, you measure the resistance response, both um, transverse and longitudinal to the strain direction. Um, so you can do this in different ways to probe different symmetries. Uh, here I'm showing the uh, B2G channel, which is the essentially with strain along the 110 tetragonal axis. Now, this is the first experiment my student did. And this was because we just simply followed what was done in the iron nictide compounds, which show a strong pneumatic susceptibility in this channel. And that involves a, placing a sample basically on a, on a 45 degree angle with respect to the strain uh, uh, application. And I remember the day when, he, when Chris walked in my office and showed me this data and said, looks like there's no pneumatic susceptibility. I said, oh, well, too bad. Okay, let's move on. Uh, luckily, he, on his own initiative, after uh, two, three months, he just decided to choose to, to measure the other orientation and found there was a huge pneumatic susceptibility. So he, he uh, did this. This is an older version of this, but you can do it like this. You can measure two samples at once. You can also do this on one sample, but you essentially measure the transport along the along and perpendicular to the strain direction, and that will give you the B1G channel. And he measured this and found a huge increase in the susceptibility, uh, which is essentially this the subtraction of the XX minus YY transport um, as a function of temperature. And we were completely shocked and started to study this more intensely. Okay, um, you can see here, for instance, the first of all, the magnitude is comparable. Uh, it's almost exactly the same as, as, for instance, in this experiment on barium iron arsenide. 
and several of the other compounds, you know, on the order of 100 in these units. Um, and you can see that the comparison here uh, of these two symmetry channels is, is, is quite dramatic, that this is almost zero, and then this is actually uh, taking off quite dramatically. Okay, and then uh, if you just look at, this is just a complicated slide, just to say that the symmetry is actually rotated from the iron compounds. If you look at the barium iron arsenide systems, <coughs> The symmetry of the pneumatic susceptibility is, is strongest along the B2G channel and in the nickel, it's along the B1G. And that's interesting, you know, in the iron compounds, it's, uh, as far as I understand, still understood to be tied to the magnetic correlations of the system, which are also along the 110 direction. Uh, but in nickel, there are no magnetic fluctuations or order or anything. And so it's uh, unclear what this channel is tied to, but that's the, that's the subject of current research. Okay. The actual raw data looks something like this. This is just delta resistance over resistance. So Rxx minus Ryy, for instance, as a function of strain. And as I said, you, you look at the uh, slope of this and that gives you a susceptibility just like in magnetization. Um, what we found, which was also surprising is that in the barium nickel arsenide, you can see at higher temperatures, there's a positive slope um, which you take this, you take that value and you can extract the susceptibility. First of all, as you cool down from 190 Kelvin down, it actually changes sign. That's one interesting thing. So if I go back uh, here, you can see it actually changes sign around uh, you know 155 Kelvin or so. Um, but the more surprising thing was actually that the uh, uh, this. Uh, Delta R over R versus strain actually uh, opened up and showed a hysteretic behavior as you cool below a certain temperature. And so hysteresis in magnetization is indication of magnetic order. And likewise, the hysteresis in pneumatic susceptibility measurements is an indication of pneumatic order. And I'll, I'll show you further evidence that actually uh, confirms that. Okay, so this is in, all in the tetragonal phase, of course. Okay, so uh, here's more careful measurements um, do, doing the same experiment, but you can see now we have a more careful measurement as you cool down. And this, this is where we cross through the triclinic transition. And the data here actually is sort of undefined. It's not, it's not a defined susceptibility in, in a certain symmetry channel, but nevertheless, that's the, me that's the actual measurement. Um, and the hysteresis that's observed actually occurs in this window below about 155 Kelvin down to the triclinic transition. So if you compare that to the charge order measurements, this is where it gets kind of interesting because you can see that the, the incommensurate charge order in the tetragonal phase also appears around the same temperature and then gets cut off at the triclinic transition where the, the commensurate charge order, the other charge order begins. So there seems to be some correlation. In fact, you can um, do a little bit better. You can compare the, um, the intensity of the X-ray counts as shown in red with uh, some measure of the hysteresis, which is actually just the width in the elastoresistance measurement and scale them together. And actually you see that they actually scale quite nicely. Mm -hmm. And that's- yeah, so, 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 yeah. so JP, yeah, I, have, I have a question actually. So and you, you said that the transition from the uh, titragonal to triclinic phase is actually first order phase transition, right? So why would you expect a pneumatic stability when you have a first order phase transition? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, what I'm, um, yeah, and okay. So I'll, <laughs> there's some more recent experiments which are probing this question, in particular, some neutron scattering from Virginos group uh, and also from the, the German group, looking at phonon softening, which actually extends even further up in temperature here. So th there's a lot of, I, I don't know is the answer, but there's some okay. questions about what is the nature of this pneumatic phase here. So okay. what's clear is that the growth of this pneumatic susceptibility uh, is not necessarily indicative of uh, just a, an approach to this triclinic transition. So it's not, 
it's in that sense, it's not similar to the iron compounds where this growth is, is upon approaching the orthorhombic transition, okay? It's a bit different than that. It's also more complicated, I think. Um, but there's also some, you can see here, for instance, you know, I'm gonna talk about Curie Weiss behavior in a second. I showed you some nice Curie Weiss curves before. Uh, you know, this actually looks pretty flat here and there's sort of a growth right here. And so the question is, is this Curie Weiss? It doesn't really look like it. But then next question is, how does that evolve with Strani? Okay, so uh, just before I get there, I'm gonna just talk about a recent experiment that uh, Peter actually asked me to show from uh, their x-ray work, where they also looked at the strength, they looked at this phase here, which we claim was a pneumatic ordered phase um, uh, using x-rays. And they, particularly they did us, you know, I'll show the experiment first. Uh, they did x-rays under strain. So they, they looked at a crystal that was placed on a piezo stack, just like we did the elastoresistance experiments, but by studying the x-ray diffraction. Um, and by doing that, they could show a correlation between the, the X-ray data and the elastoresistance data that we claim to, use, to be a proof of a pneumatic order. And, you know, okay, I'm not gonna go through this, but in short, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the anisotropy and the charge density that's probed directly from X-ray is, is a measure of the pneumatic order parameter if there's an ordered phase, and that's just shown by this free energy uh, uh, relation with the, uh, the coupling between the pneumatic and charge degrees of freedom. Um, and so that's what they did. They essentially did a study of the, uh, the 0.28 incommensurate charge order peaks as a function of strain. So the strain, is, so here's cooling. So, so sorry, there's a, this is for, uh, strain perpendicular to the, the charge order direction, cooling and warming. And then this is per parallel to the charge order direction, cooling and warming. And you can see that the strain is actually opposite in both cases. So the increasing strain increases the intensity in, in these two and decreases the intensity in these two. Uh, so what Peter's group did was to essentially take, extract the charge density from this intensity and take the difference to see how that maps. And you can see very nicely that as you apply strain and break the, uh, the trigonal susceptibility, you actually develop this order parameter. And you can plot that as a, uh, uh, analyze that as an extracted pneumatic susceptibility, which matches quite nicely to our elastic resistance experiment. And so this is a nice confirmation of the pneumatic order that we see as measured by x-ray. As far as I understand, this is the first time this kind of experiment was done, so it's quite nice. Okay, so back to this uh, series. So now that I was only talking about the nickel arsenide, bar uh, barium nickel arsenide. Now I'm gonna talk about what happens when you put strontium in the system. Um, I don't think I put uh, x-ray data, but essentially when you put strontium in, the C-axis reduces uniformly from x equals zero to one. So it essentially, essentially acts as a uh, chemical pressure in this system. And as I said, originally we were quite interested in using this effect to try to induce a, a trigonal collapse in the system because the unit, the unit cell C axis decreases by about one angstrom across this phase diagram. But that's another story. Uh, what I'm focusing on here is the, uh, the charge order phases, the pneumatic phases and pneumatic susceptibility. So you can see that the triclinic transition, as I showed before, goes continuously down, but in fact, at this about 70% strontium, gets abruptly cut off. And so if you go just above this, this is the trigonal all the way down. Um, so there's some kind of first order transition between these two, uh, these two phases along the uh, sub substitution axis. Um, and you know, in passing, that, that line actually does we do believe that coincides with the, the formation of arsenic dimers or the so-called collapse transition. But as, as I said, it's very subtle in the X-ray data. But we do think that that plays a role in, in determining what the ground state is. Okay, so 
Looking at the pneumatic susceptibility as measured by elastic resistance as a function of X. Now, this is the data I showed before. You can see that it evolves quite nicely. Uh, it's very strong until you get to near to the strontium side, until it's just very barely visible and then completely gone by X equals one. And so that's what I, this is another indication that the strontium nickel arsenide material is quite boring, but you don't need much. You just need to go about this far to get some quite dramatic behavior. And I'll elaborate on that in terms of superconductivity in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so if I put all this data together, um, what we have is uh, this same phase diagram now, now uh, contour colored with the pneumatic susceptibility data on top. And you can see uh, there's a quite dramatic increase as you approach the triclinic phase. Um, there's some, you know, there's some envelope here, which uh, as I'll explain is the ordered pneumatic phase, which is tied very strongly to this incommensurate charge order phase. So if one is there, the other is there. If one is gone, the other is gone. And then finally, when you truncate this triclinic phase, there's still a very strong pneumatic susceptibility, but it dies off very quickly as you go towards the strong. And I'm gonna also show a, a, an improved phase diagram or a more recent one where we've actually, with Peter's group, uh, mapped out the charge order phases here as well. Okay, so regarding the pneumatic susceptibility and the Curie-Weiss behavior, as I said, it's not quite Curie-Weiss. And in fact, if you look at the, sorry, this is a bit truncated, but it's just to show on the same scale that the pneumatic susceptibility in the X equals zero compound uh, basically onsets near the ordered phase, the pneumatic ordered phase. That's true up to about 0 0.5, four or five, where we believe that this pneumatic order goes away. And then above that, uh, what we see is actually very nice Curie-Weiss behavior, much like the iron nictide compounds. So, so this is this is a, the, the dashed line is a Curie-Weiss fit. And then, and then, so once the triclinic phase is gone, there's actually a broad maximum, which I'll, I'll come back to in a few minutes as well. And then that that goes away, and then there's a very shallow behavior, and then it goes completely away at x equals one. Um, so first of all, the, regarding the pneumatic order and it's tied to the charge order in this tetragonal phase, uh, we actually just published this work, which just confirms that once you get beyond this phase where there's no evidence of pneumatic order, there's also no evidence of incommensurate charge order above the triclinic transition. That's just shown here. It's a negative result, but it just confirms that, that when we see hysteresis in the, in the Elastoresistivity, we see the incommensurate charge order and vice versa. So that seems to be strongly tied. Um, now, regarding the multiple charge orders, uh, this is a more recent paper just last year by Peter's group uh, studying the, the charge order evolution through this phase diagram. And uh, I'm not going to go through the data in detail, but just to show the phase diagram and the order parameters themselves, uh, the picture is basically this, that there's a, as I said, there's an incommensurate charge order in the tetragonal phase that coexists with the pneumatic order. It dies around 0.6 or 0.55. In the triclinic phase, there's evidence of two, at least two charge order phases, both commensurate, but with different Q vectors. So this one was 0.33. And in this regime, it seems to be 0.5. And uh, you can see the evolution of that here. This is the incommensurate charge order as a function of temperature that comes down, down, down. By 0.65, there's no evidence of that. And there's only the 0.5 charge order, commensurate charge order in the triclinic phase. Okay, tell me if I'm going too fast. I'll just uh, keep going if, unless there's any questions. Okay, everyone still with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, oops. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the other thing that was interesting in this data was this. Uh, where's my circle? There it is. 
this interesting maximum in the susceptibility. So as you can see at the triclinic phase, there's a very sharp peak in fact, but in this phase, this 0.75 sample, uh, there's a sort of, you know, there's a curie vice behavior, but then it turns over to this broad maximum around 20 Kelvin or so, and then turns down a bit. And, you know, there's no evidence of anything else happening at this transition that we can find, at least in transport, uh, in other measurements that we've done. And so it's a bit of a question what's happening here. Why isn't there, uh, you know, for instance, if there was a nomadic order there, then we might expect to see some hysteresis or something, but we don't see anything like that. Um, so what I really noticed fairly recently was that uh, this nice study by Shibayuchi San and company of the rubidium system, which I mentioned earlier, has a striking uh, similarity, in fact, right here. So I don't know if this is the case, and this is something we have to study. We have not studied actually. Yeah, th th uh, this is this is what I mentioned earlier. I mean, this this work is actually controversial, right? Because there's, okay. yeah, yeah. there's a PRL. Yeah, there's a paper by by the uh, there's a PRL paper by a, a German group, basically uh, saying that it's a, it's a, some, some sort of artifact. I don't know whether that's true or not. Yeah. I see. I mean, well, I was suspect in the sense that if you look at the pure rubidium measurement, you okay. First of all, when I see the nomadic susceptibility amplitudes getting in the hundreds, I'm a bit suspect that the mm -hmm. experiment is not being done correctly. Maybe, maybe Junghao, I, mean, I saw Junghao is here. Maybe Junghao can make some comments on this because I'm not an expert. I mean, Junghao, I assume, is an expert on this. Uh, yeah. Sure, I'd be happy to hear. <laughs> yeah, so I, I put him on the spot. <laughs> Thanks, Wang Chen. Um, yeah, I think uh, the work by Anna Bomer has shown that uh, this response is actually mostly dominated by a A1G response. Ah. So, yeah, so this is um, just because uh, I think by Shibochi groups, uh, their measurements was done in this uh, differential elastic resistance method, which in some cases you might not be able to fully cancel out the A1G component. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, they get A1G component. And then this hump is actually, so this dominant a, A1G effect is coming from, um, well, proposed by Anna Bomer is that uh, it's actually an effect of A1G strain that modulates the um, gamma, the density of states. You know, so that this very overall sample is actually very close to a quantum critical point. And then your A1G strain is turning your distance to a quantum critical point. So therefore your, your gamma is very sensitive to A1G. And then therefore by changing gamma, you're changing your uh, the t square reciprocal coefficient a lot, and then therefore you you see a large a one g uh, elastic resistance, and then this hump is actually has something to do with the temperature dependent of the uh, resistance because you're normalizing by the temperature dependent of resistance. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll take a look at that. So okay, then maybe this comparison is not uh, worth making. <laughs> uh, as far as I understand, a one g is very small and or, or nothing in this in our compound, so I'm not sure what the nature of this is. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, it, just the the uh, prospect of this kind of crossover for some reason happening, you know, perhaps we just haven't done the measurements we have to check. Um, okay. Oops. Okay, so that brings us to the superconducting state uh, in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, so, you know, following what I said before, there's of course interest to understand what's the uh, connection between pneumatic susceptibility or fluctuations and pairing. And I already flashed data showing that TC is enhanced. So I'm gonna go through that in a bit, bit of detail now. So uh, the, the uh, punchline is that as we increase uh, the pneumatic susceptibility, we increase TC. And we get it up to from about 0.6 Kelvin up to as high as 3.5 Kelvin. And so we're when we're at this peak here, uh, the superconductivity is actually quite well behaved. You know, you can see all the typical measurements showing here, nice T sharp transition and so on. Uh, it still looks BCS like. Um, so it, the interesting scenario here is that we have a uh, conventional BCS phonon mediated superconductor that's actually uh, has a potential pairing potential that's enhanced by by the pneumatic fluctuations and that was further studied by Sam Letter and company in a follow-up paper which I'll flash 
Um, so the picture here is that, uh, as I showed, that, that the TC is, is basically peaked right at this point. Uh, and that's where the, you know, where the pneumatic susceptibility is, is diverging closest to you know, the superconducting temperature. And then, you know, what I always say in these talks is that, you know, I, went all, I just went through all this complicated business in this part of the phase diagram with multiple charge orders, pneumatic order, pin to charge order and the tetragonal phase, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I often want to reverse this talk and which I am just too lazy to do and just start by showing the data from here to here, <laughs> which is just a tetragonal system with no orders of any kind. Uh, and just a pneumatic susceptibility that's growing strongly and a TC that's growing strongly. And that's quite amazing, right? Um, now, uh, I circled this part here so that you might think that there's a dome here actually, but in fact, the blue triangles are specific heat measurements. So you can see that there's a growth of TC, uh, but once you hit the triclinic phase, the bulk TC actually drops down and it's just flat. It's completely flat in this range in triclinic phase. And we believe that that is just um, um, is just consistent with the picture that there's no fluctuations of of the, the pneumatic state in the triclinic phase. And so this TC is just down here. Now, there's something interesting that happens here, and that is that the resistive transition starts creeping up and actually almost meets this one. And the susceptibility transition, the Meisner screening, follows. And so you might ask, what kind of state is this? And our first, our gut reaction was that, well, this is just some disordered or uh, some some um, uh, inhomogeneity in the strontium concentration. But in fact, we have no, we have zero evidence to suggest that the samples just on the left of this line are any more inhomogeneous than the samples just to the right. And so we always believe that this was somehow intrinsic. And in fact, I don't have the, the plot again, but if you go back to, I'm sorry, this paper here with uh, Peter, uh, Eduardo Fradkin gave us some insight into this and suggested that in fact, this enhancement of TC here is actually due to these domain walls. So it's basically a competition with this charge ordered phase. Um, where there's domain walls of the charge order and on the domain walls where the order is weakened, this superconductivity is actually enhanced. And that would be consistent with the fact that we don't see bulk superconducting phase here, but filamentary. Okay. So that's that picture. Um, just to say that the, as I said, the, uh, if you just go from the pure strontium end over to the left, uh, to me, that's the most striking effect in this in this whole system that you just enhance the pneumatic susceptibility and you enhance TC dramatically. And in fact, if you look at the heat capacity, there's no evidence of anything else happening. It's not like the density of states is changing, uh, phonon, et cetera. It's a, you know, all you see, the main effect is TC going up and the pneumatic susceptibility going up. But but the but your pneumatic susceptibility actually goes up, you know, starts to drop, right? At a temperature well above TC. So you have this, I mean, I guess you, you don't quite understand that. I'm sorry, the what? I mean, the susceptibility actually shows a, a very broad peak, right? At a TC, I mean, roughly yeah. you know, 25K, right? Still well above TC, right? Yeah. So, so you, you really cannot say that the stability actually peaks at TC, right? It's actually- Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm trying not, I'm not trying to imply that the susceptibility should peak at TC. I'm just saying that it's strongly enhanced. In fact- Okay, okay. If you consider the Curie-Weiss you know, evolution, that it's it's increasing continuously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, if I go back to this phase diagram, you know, you can see here we actually drew a dashed line here. Mm -hmm. It is interesting that this peak actually lies on the extension of this triclinic phase boundary. So one might think that the system is sort of susceptible to structural transition and what goes along with that, and perhaps that's why. The pneumatic susceptibility turns over, but we I, I, we don't have any strong evidence for that. I think we have to do some other experiment to try to prove that. Okay. 
Um, yeah, and then as I said, uh, Sam Letter did a follow-up paper when he was working with Una Kim, uh, in particular applied to the system to understand uh, the effect of some pneumatic fluctuations on the pairing potential in a BCS phonon superconductor. And you know, this doesn't give it justice, but basically they did show that the pairing potential, the V actually can be can be enhanced and lead to an enhanced TC. Um, and, and they provided some theoretical tests, which we are currently trying to follow up in particular, looking at the uh, evolution of heat capacity more carefully, uh, the density of states via some kind of tunneling or, or uh, spectroscopic experiment, which should have some interesting signatures, um, as well as, yeah, the, uh, well, this is TC and this is the pairing. Uh, this is the coupling between the two. Okay, so there's some, there's some, uh, uh, some strict uh, uh, predictions for what we should see in this system, if that's true. Okay, so in the last uh, couple of minutes, I'm just gonna flash through a couple very recent papers just to bring you up to speed on, on what's the recent work on this system and try to <laughs> do my very best to paraphrase them as far as I understand from what I uh, quickly read. Um, so there's a, uh, um, uh, there's a nice uh, study by the Bergino group looking at the soft phonon modes and basically seeing a softening, a very interesting result. And this is also, as far as I understand, reproduced or measured in parallel by the uh, line gas group as well. Uh, essentially, they see a softening that starts to happen much, much above the uh, charge order phase. And uh, so this slowing down, you know, as depicted in this schematic here, this usually happens uh, at the charge order transition, but somehow in the system it happens at much higher temperatures. So that's suggesting that um, uh, that uh, th there's something else. It's not just a uh, the, uh, the the phonon modes are driving the charge order, but it's something more interesting than that. Okay, so that's the first paper. Um, there's some papers by the uh, Luthesson and uh, mine gas groups studying um, uh, uh, various measurements on the system, including phosphorus substitution. As I said I, in the beginning that the phosphorus substitution seems to uh, stabilize an orthorhombic phase. And it's a bit of a question whether that actually happens truly at X equals zero or not. Um, they claim it does, and as I showed you some of the data, so I think it needs to be confirmed. Uh, but it seems to be more clear as you put in phosphorus. I showed 3% data, which was this data point here. It's more clear in the dilatometry experiment that that's, that's true. Uh, so you can see a similar phase diagram with phosphorus. Uh, and this was actually studied by Nohara years before us, in fact, where, first of all, the superconductivity also is flat in the triclinic phase and jumps up immediately in the tetragonal phase. But the difference in this system First of all, is that the, the, the superconducting transition, it, you know, you should say, well, that's very similar. But in fact, this, it's a three and a half Kelvin TC, and this just travels all the way over to pure barium nickel two phosphorus two. So we concluded early on that this TC is, in fact, it's just sort of a switch from the phosphorus dominated structure between this line and that line to the uh, uh, arsenic dominated structure. But interestingly, you can see that uh, there's a strong pneumatic susceptibility, same channel that evolves through this phase diagram. And in fact, you can see that there's some evolution that just goes right beyond the triclinic phase. So the relation between this and this and our system, I'm not so sure about yet, um, but this does seem to be tied very strongly to this orthorhombic phase that, that emerges. Um, whoops. Yeah, okay, and then uh, again, this was just last month published in uh, NatureCom by the same group. Uh, this is again, the phosphorus substitution. Uh, they're essentially saying that, uh, you know, this pneumatic susceptibility um, uh, lives quite high in temperature and that that is in principle 
evidence of a some new phase, new pneumatic phase. It's not just a fluctuation, but actually some quote unquote liquid phase that lives up here. And you know, there's some theoretical modeling and some other experimental evidence uh, supporting that. I I haven't decided my opinion on this yet, but you can decide for yourself. Okay, and uh, that'll bring me to my conclusions. So I hope I showed you that the uh, the barium nickel two arsenic two, although there's no magnetic order, no magnetic fluctuations. Um, is quite interesting, surprisingly. You know, 10 years ago, nobody would have thought to write an SF proposal on this compound. <laughs> but, um, now, hopefully, uh, there'll be lots of, uh, well, there'll be some additional funding to try to study the system, in particular, because it has these quite simple aspects, like no, mag no magnetism, uh, phonon-mediated superconductivity, and some strong, likely uh, orbital driven pneumatic susceptibility that has many different tuning parameters such as pressure, strontium substitution, phosphorus. Uh, it's tied to these structural phases and these charge ordered phases. So there's a lot of interest there. Um, so the charge orders, multiple charge orders are quite interesting. We have some, we have at least mapped them out and now we're continuing to understand their relation to these other phases and fluctuations. Um, and this pneumatic susceptibility and it's tied to superconductivity, which to me is probably the most interesting thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have to probe in some different ways, in particular looking at the ground state of the superconducting order to see if there's evidence of some uh, any unconventional behavior, for instance. So with that, thanks for your attention and happy to answer questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you, JP. Yeah, yeah any, any questions? Hi. Uh, uh, hey, Patrick. Yeah. Hey. Uh, how are you? Great talk. Hi, Patrick. Uh, I'm wondering whether you have actually uh, avoided the chicken and egg problem because uh, the, the chicken here may be the charge density wave, right? Because uh, um, so the question is whether this is driven, is the charge density wave is a driver or the pneumatic? Because uh, it's, as far as I understand it, yeah, once you have a charge, if you have a unidirectional charge density wave, of course, you break the. Uh, X Y symmetry, and that should be you should definitely have a enhanced pneumatic susceptibility, right? And here you have two, as I understand it, right? You have, you have two charge density waves, uh, to, uh, uh, but you know the response can be asymmetric because the you know the charge density wave this way may respond only to to this kind of modulation, and the other one doesn't. So, so I think it's quite natural that you have a pneumatic. Uh, um, response um, if you have a presence of a charge, uh, charge sensitive wave, right? And so I think it's not surprising that they, they come together. And um, so, you know, uh, then, then the question is that, you know, is, is the superconductivity being enhanced by some soft mode um, that goes with a charge sensitive wave or do you have the appeal to pneumatic? So I think uh, one runs into the same, you know, if you replace the old, uh, Spin density wave with charge density wave, you might end up with the same uh, uh, conundrum. So, 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 Patrick, so you basically you're saying it's still a basically BCS, just slightly enhanced by CDW. For example, you know, it could be the some soft fold, some phonon mm -hmm. softening, and and so on, right? So, uh, I I don't know what you can ever uh, you know sort that out <laughs> because well, I, I think the two you know, always the, come hand in hand, the, right? The experiments I just showed from. Uh, Studying, looking at the phonon softening, I think you can probably do those in this regime here. Right. Yeah. I, I think this regime, you know, everybody's focusing over here and then doing phosphorus, all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. What I want to study is this regime because it's quite right. simple mm -hmm. and you know, yeah, exactly. You can do some really nice experiments. To, to right. Yeah. Ideas, you know. yeah. Presumably, there will be fluctuating some uh, charge density as well, so you probably expect some kind of softening. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. like, you know. Yeah. Perhaps. So the other question is that you know has. There's no evidence for that, I should say. Yeah. So. Has this been studied for so known charge density? We have many examples of unidirectional charge density wave. So I think maybe it's time to go back and just measure the pneumatic susceptibility of those things. Uh, oh, yeah. Sure. I bet they, they're over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So that may be uh, when we're, we're doing that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. So, Amir? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for somehow 
good, nice results. I have a question regarding, uh, for instance, this this superconducting dome or not. So even in your plot now, in this last slide, if I look at it for the resistivity data, it looks like a dome. For the uh, specific heat, it looks like a jump uh, around um, seventy percent. So um, my question is: In all these publications from Abamonte, you and so on, you're talking all about a dome. I'm not sure if this is really a dome, uh, uh, as when you compare it to uh, all the works with the specific heat from Kudo et al. And uh, what we have done, uh, we don't see actually a dome. Um, so that is one question of mine. And the second is more a comment. In the beginning, you said that um, the um, uh, orbital um, order is a consequence uh, of a structure transition, uh, um, and that's not trivial. And uh, to my understanding, from the physics point of view, it's very well trivial, actually, from the oxides that we know, um, um, the orbital order or Yantella distortion causes actually that there is a structure uh, the structure distortion. So in the oxides. Yeah? Um, so what is your opinion on that? And uh, uh, the first thing about the dome or not? Okay, sure. Thanks for the question. So um, the second question, I yeah, I, I mean, I just use this slide as a sort of introduction for for uh, you know a very simple introduction to the charge orbital and structural degrees of freedom. I, I'm not necessarily implying that orbital orbital degrees of freedom cannot drive structural degrees of freedom in a trivial way. So so you're right. I don't disagree with you uh, regarding the dome. Yeah, so in, in our work, we never say dome. <laughs> and I explained why that, that is ex exactly this data that we took that there's the bulk superconductivity just you know takes a jump here. Um, and uh, if you know if the word dome appears in some other papers, that's uh, I apologize. It's not, we're, not, we're not implying that there's a dome around. I, I know that some some of my colleagues like to still, you know. With their loving eyes, see a quantum critical point with a dome around this, and I don't agree with that at all. I think there's a there's a sharp cutoff here that's shown in all the measurements we do, uh, and this was a bit of a question: Why was there a resistive uh, trace of superconductivity that that persisted to make it look like some kind of dome, although it's not bulk superconductivity? And I explained that uh, uh, you know. The current understanding of that is that this may arise due to um, domain antiphase domain wall formation in the charge order phase, where you would have a weakening of the charge order, and therefore you, you might have some filamentary type, uh, uh, you know, some small volume fraction of the sample showing filamentary superconductivity that's like this side of the phase diagram. That's all I'm saying. So there's no dome. Uh, it's just a trace of superconductivity that looks a lot like this one. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah, Ming. What, what can Ming to ask? I, I, I'll ask uh, late the last. <laughs> yeah, hey, Ming, Ming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, JP. Nice to see you again. Uh, I just want, just very quick, uh, just wanted to confirm: uh, is the divert is the divergence of the metasensibility happening at the orthorhombic transition or the triclinic transition? Uh, well, it, it depends how you define that, right? So if I go back, I, I, yeah, if I look at the data here, right? Um, you know, so in this in this paper when we did this, we were just we weren't sure what was happening here because we weren't uh, as as well informed about this ordered phase, etc. But uh, this this fit here is a Curie vice fit. So if you want to just fit this small piece of the data, which is you know really the diverging part, then yes, it diverges the triclinic phase. So, but so, what I said was you know it's quite strange that this was quite flat above. You know why, why is this just going negative suddenly? Whereas up here it looks much more like a Curie vice behavior. So this you know I, this looks like it's diverging you know, just above the triclinic phase and not necessarily tied to it. 
but that's you know that's the granularity of our data. So I'm not exactly sure how to how do you how do you uh, because of this evolution of this phase diagram, how do you uh, decide the barrier the boundaries of your fits for Curie Vice or some other kind of divergence fit? It's a bit complicated. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just used to thinking about in the iron base case, the divergence happens at the rotational symmetry breaking temperature, mm -hmm. uh, which is also the onset of pneumatic order, I guess. But that's all based on some Curie Vice fit, right? Right. Okay. From like room temperature down. And there's, and here I'm saying that, you know, if you try to do this, it, you know, for some small range, okay, fine, you can fit this pretty well. Um, but, you know, once you go away from that, it kind of fails. So then how do you, what do you conclude from that? I see. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Yiming. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so I have a question about uh, the pneumatic susceptibility. So in the in the triclinic transition, the pneumatic susceptibility behaves as a second order phase transition. I mean, it, although it is still divergent in the triclinic side. So how do you account for this? I mean, the, the triclinic transition is uh, first order transition. Yeah, this was the question I asked uh, JP earlier. Yeah, you're asking me why is this diverging towards the yeah. triclinic transition? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm more interested in the in the triclinical side. It is also diverging here. Yeah, yeah. So as I uh, as I mentioned in the talk, um, this data is more or less meaningless because it has no. It, this is this is not. We just show it because we measured it, but. Uh, you know, at the very best, this would indicate that there's some transition coming. It doesn't necessarily mean anything because it's not, it's not the same symmetry channel you're measuring. Yeah, yeah. So to, so I don't, you cannot, I don't think there's a way to use elasto-resistivity to measure uh, the pneumatic symmetry channel in the triclinic phase. You'd have to do something much more sophisticated. So, so, so JP, I still, I mean, have not gotten your, your picture, I mean, uh, and for any sort of first order phase transition, you would not expect any critical behavior. Therefore, you know, there's no Curie West expected, right? How, right. how do you understand this puzzle of, of I may mean, seeing something, but in a, such a narrow regime? Right. Well, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. When we first published this work with Raphael, we we thought we understood it. Well, that was when we believed this was a unidirectional charge order. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we in that paper we put in a Ginzburg-Landau model, which essentially showed a sort of uh, let me just show this phase diagram evolution from uh, structurally driven to electronic driven uh, pneumatic uh, uh, susceptibility. And, but, but I'm not so sure that that model is correct anymore, knowing that this, this is not unidirectional. Yeah, it's bidirectional. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, it, so the, yeah, short answer is I, I'm not sure, but you know, obviously there's something. But data is data, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah data is no, data. No, no, one, no one is, well, maybe the free will demand you to understand it, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, there's obviously another degree of freedom that's the right. thematic susceptibility is reflecting or the order itself, and that the system goes triclinic for another reason. Yeah. OK, any, any other question for JP? OK, it, it's fantastic. I mean, it's great. We have like more than 90 people attending, you know, for so, oh, wow. so, so, so your, your talk is very popular. So we're going to post that on YouTube yeah. and then more people will listen to you. you know, they may send okay. you, a, you know, email for questions. <laughs> Maybe I'll go viral. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, JP. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. If anyone wants to stick around, I'm happy to talk a little more. Yeah, so we actually, I actually invited the the the, the guy that the that did the the Rama sketching to give a talk on the same topic. So, because I really want to understand, you know, what's so he, he's, you know, yeah. He, he's, Which person? He's, oh, the, the 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 Nature Comp paper, the Lacan. So he's giving a talk as well. Okay. So maybe great. in September sometime. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, so so I, originally I invited 
you know, Peter to give a talk as well, but he, he has more exciting stuff to talk about. That's why he said the yeah. he a couple of slides. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. So, so, why yeah. I was able to cover his yeah, yeah. recent stuff. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and at M squared S, there was a whole session on Nickel Arsa. I don't know if you attended that, but no, I. No, I have not. Unfortunately, I, I got a conflict. It was attending some other well, I didn't even, I mean, it was just uh, the title was a bit obscure, so I didn't. I didn't even know about it, and I missed it. So I right, 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 right. Uh, but yeah, but, but this topic, I think this topic will actually rejuvenize because you guys work. I mean, it's really going to be, yeah, coming coming up with, with more people talking about this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that, no, that, that's I, great. Uh, that's great for you, right? That means your paper will be more cited. You know. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, you I'm, know, I'm I'm not totally convinced about this. Uh, you know, your 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 nomad, your interpretation of nomadic sensibility is a reason for the. Uh, for enhanced TC. I mean, the reason I say that is because, you know, you based on your data, right? It looks like there's a, you know, sort of a jump in TC, but your pneumatic stability, you know, from left to right is gradually sort of a changing, right? But right. I, I'm more, I'm more buying your argument from right to left. You know, if you look at that part, you know, certainly something is increasing, right? On the poaching. That's right. I, I, think, I think that's probably, you know, potentially, you know, sort of a more, more reasonable, but, but, you know, the P, I mean, uh, yeah, Patrick could be right, right? It could be some, some simply, you know, something to do with the charge ordering enhanced the yeah. PCS. No, that's why I'd love for, yeah. you know, I, 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 we don't do these, you know, complicated experiments. So I'd love for someone to- Yeah, we're gonna look at the phone on. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. for instance, we should convince Peter to do the momentum yields experiment, for instance. I'm not sure he can cool below TC. I don't think he has the ability. Uh, uh, no, but you don't have to, right? You just- study it in the in the temperature range you can as you approach mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know from the strontium side yeah, yeah, yeah. Look okay. at the softening okay. modes and so on this is exactly what patrick was asking yeah okay and uh you know we're we're, we're trying to study the low temperature phenomenon but i as far as i can tell the superconductivity doesn't look unusual it looks fairly conventional so is it just a pcs the TC. tc is higher yeah 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 there, we have a, we have tried with some collaborators to do SDM, but unfortunately the cleaving doesn't work. Doesn't work well. So no one has been able to study the superconducting state yet. Maybe me, maybe Ming can. I mean, she because she she's looking at the. I, mean, I guess she can't cool below, like you know, three Kelvin. I mean, that's it's quite low TC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She can't. Cool it would be nice three. to look at. Like I showed this prediction of the uh, density of states. It actually has two peaks, mm -hmm. so it'd be pretty easy to see in principle. Yeah, 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 yeah. SDM, but nobody has, has approached it yet. You know, there's other materials in the world that are interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're right. I mean, maybe people with working on nickel, it's getting a bit more exciting. So. Yeah. Okay, great. Good, good to see you, JP. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks.